order. So this is just a reminder page. I'm gonna kind of breeze past that one since Mark covered it pretty well about, it's kind of that one point, one stop access. Um, I do encourage you guys to get the app on your phone because it's a really quick resource to be able to use. Um, but for time's sake, actually I'm doing pretty good. We're talking a lot faster than I thought. Um, we're gonna go ahead and go to key crime reporting terminology. So these, termino these terms are directly from the PPB website. So this is how your officers generally should be defining these terms to you and this is how they work off of these to be able to do reports, to be able to do arrests and respond for the priority of calls. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, is it one through three is high priority dispatch and then four through seven is low priority, correct? So the key for getting the proper priority on a call is making sure that you're using the right terminology as well as giving proper descriptions. TV is great, but it also kind of sucks because they always use the wrong terms in cop shows all the time. Somebody comes home from vacation, they see their door is kicked in, all their stuff is gone. They call 911 and they say, I was robbed. Well, you weren't robbed, you were burglarized. There's a big difference. That's two totally different priorities on a police call. So does anybody know the difference between burglary and robbery? Aside from the officers? <laughs> Behind you. Yeah. I know the difference. Well, can you, do you wanna say what the difference sure. is? Sure. Burglary is usually going into a dwelling and taking something or attempting to take something. Robbery is using a weapon against the person to take something. Mm -hmm. Or they don't even need a weapon. It's a threat of violence. So if you look um, at these terms, burglary is the unlawful entry into a building or other structure with the intent to commit a theft. So it can be the $20 shack that you bought at some lawn sale that you're tying together and shutting with dental floss. It does not matter. That is your dwelling, that is your structure, it is on your property. They break that dental floss and they go in there, they are burglarizing your property. That is a burglary. And those lines are very, very thin at the same time. Somebody, there can be a burglary in progress. Say somebody breaks into your home and you're upstairs. There's nobody to their knowledge in the dwelling. They broke in with the intent to steal something. It's not their dwelling, it's your dwelling. You're hiding upstairs, okay? You can call in and say, somebody's actively burglarizing my house. They don't know I'm here, I'm hiding in the closet. Okay. If you then step downstairs and they make any form of verbal confrontation to you saying, you move, I'm gonna kill you, or say you step down the stairs and you don't know they're there and you're in front of the doorway, they run past you and they hit your shoulder and push you, it is now a robbery. Once they make that contact, once they make that threat, once they make any form of violence or intimidation, that is a robbery to take your property and it doesn't have to be in a dwelling. If you're here at the park and somebody says, give me all of your stuff or I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat the crap out of you, that is a robbery, okay? That is always gonna be a 911 call. And so is a burglary. Uh, if a burglary already occurred, that could potentially be an non-emergency call. Um, unless you see the person fleeing from your home, that would be a burglary in progress, that would be an accident. If you're never, if you're ever questioning if it's a 911 or non-emergency, when in doubt, call 911. They will tell you if it was not a 911 call. Um, one of the other key pieces that I wanna touch on, and it's really helpful for the officers, it's the difference between probable cause and reasonable suspicion. Does anybody know the difference between those? Aside from the officers, once again. <laughs> I hope you guys know. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, probable cause is having some kind of small amount of evidence that something, that someone did something. Like, um, say someone's driving down the street in a white car and, um, they, uh, a call came in about a robbery and an, and an officer sees a white car go by. It was a white car, white Dodge, let's say. Um, that would be probable cause to stop it. Okay, so there, that's, that's a good example. A little bit more specific of an example. Uh, well, first I'll just read, it, uh, read the terms behind it. And so the probable cause is reasonable belief that a person has committed or will commit a crime for the probable cause to exist, a police officer must have sufficient knowledge or facts to warrant the belief that a suspect is committing a crime. The belief must be based on factual evidence, not just suspicion, okay? So that's where that accuracy of reporting and being able to identify the behavior is a key, key thing. Just because somebody looks sketchy or they're not normal in your neighborhood and they're suspicious to you, doesn't mean that their behavior is criminal. So Mark likes to give an example. You've got somebody who's looking really disheveled, they're walking down your street, you're not used to them being there, but they're walking with purpose. They have every legal right to be there. They can walk down that street with all the purpose they want. They're doing nothing wrong. Then you have somebody who's wearing a $500 suit. They're walking down the street. They're looking into the cars. They're pulling on the handles. 
that is suspicious behavior despite the way that person looks. The only effects that how that person looks in their description is for reporting for accuracy to give the officers probable cause. Okay? So reasonable suspicion is the legal standard by which a police officer has the right to briefly detain a suspect for investigatory purposes and frisk the outside of their clothing for weapons but not drugs. Okay, so they're only frisking them for. Any real quick questions we got, guys? Oh yeah, do you guys have any questions so for them directly? Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank All right, you. thank you again for showing up. Then we got your guys' cards. If you guys want some of that information from when they're done. Um, so the the main thing on this is they can only frisk it, frisk them if they can't search through their items. They can't um, check their pockets, check their hands, and unless they think that they have a weapon on it. So it's really for their own safety. And uh, when you're giving those accurate descriptions, if you say I saw a white male who was trying to break into a car and he went, he was wearing a black jacket and blue jeans and he went southbound off of, you know, whatever street. Okay, well, five blocks away, I saw a white male who was wearing a black jacket and blue jeans. Uh, I don't know if the description is close to where this is occurring. That might be him. Okay, that's only reasonable suspicion. And so they can kind of stop the guy, they can talk to him, where'd you come from, where are you going, what have you been doing, maybe even check his name. They can frisk him, but they can't do a whole lot more. The likelihood that they're going to detain that person is very, very low. Okay? But if you give them probable cause, there was a great example that happened. Yeah, there for now. We don't know where the car went. It didn't take it up to the car. Yeah, the central precinct in the middle of the day. There was a gentleman who was going, and he was leaning into the car windows, and he was walking to multiple cars. He was pulling okay, on the Okay, yeah, and the only descriptions of the vehicle that from the other call were a gold sedan, and then a big white SUV that killed out. He was going to multiple cars and he was walking up and down the streets and doing it over and over. People were looking at him. He was just we acting very strange and um, to touching a lot of the cars. So they decided to report it. They gave a very accurate description of what that person looked like, the behavior yeah, that they were exhibiting, and where they were going. When the officers responded to that, they knew exactly who that person was, where to find him, and that gave them reasonable or, uh, probable cause to then search his backpack, see if he had committed a theft, if he had items that were his wallets, all that kind of stuff. So I'll kind of pass this around and show you guys, because it's a little bit dark. But what they found instead is this. So what this is, is a lot of drugs, a loaded weapon, knives, crack pipes, all that stuff. So they didn't get him on theft, but what they did get him on was a lot more. So having an illegal, uh, an illegal license and having narcotics, all these other things. So all she was reporting was because he might have stole something. And then the behavior he was exhibiting was suspicious. She gave a great description of the person and it ended up in a different kind of collar. So and to clarify knowing how to report light, those things and having those things in mind is really essential to the police top. and even to the rangers because maybe you see those things, you give that information to the rangers and then they leave the property, the rangers can now pass that on to your officers. So making sure that you guys are making those connections or doing those multiple reports to help out any of the people who are responding to those types of calls. Um, so if you guys don't forget what precinct you're in as well, uh, do you guys know Portland Maps? Yeah, you guys are good with Portland Maps? If you guys, I forgot to collect them. If you do have questionnaires, I might grab those from you guys real quick, actually. Do you want to collect them before I forget? Sorry, I usually collect the questionnaires right in the beginning. But um, we'll put those together for a block map for you guys to make it a little bit easier so you guys can stay connected and communicate and maybe organize some more meetings. Um, so Portland Maps is a great way to find all of your neighborhood information. You're going to be finding your neighborhood, you can find your police precinct, you can find your firehouses, you can find your beacons, you can find all that information. So you guys have each precinct. So that main front desk number, it is only manned on regular business hours, so the kind of 9 to 5 Monday through Friday situation. And that's 823-4800. Um, so if you guys ever want to contact the you're going to contact. And it's getting dark, so we're going to probably... Let me see what I can wrap through. So, Septet is part of the main problem that we get. That's the thing, and that doesn't apply as much to car flush. Being able to run the park can be essential. So it's kind of that park maintenance. So all it is is the concept of designing out crime. Is there things in the park? Is there overgrowth? Is there places to hide? Is there areas to camp? Is there, the, is there something that you can do to change that um, with the city, with your park rangers, with that maintenance, or in your own home to try to address the situation? Is there proper here, lighting? Is there cracked sidewalks? Is there things that can cause potential danger? Um, so there is a packet in there, and this packet explains that fully in depth. There's also uh, SEPTED is a national concept. So you can look up any information on that, um, and they have it. It's something that's used all over, actually internationally. And there is a workbook packet in here 
And I encourage you guys, if you have time, to go through that with them. If you have your own residence, a house is possibly able to the shooting 412-1039. Here, and see where you land on that. We do have a septet specialist, and that's going to be for your neighborhood. Let's see, you guys are so it's going to be Terry Papineau. Terry Papineau is your guys' step-test specialist. She can come out and evaluate the part. She can evaluate your residence. She can do all that different sorts of stuff. So I'm going to jump ahead um, for car prowls. We also, a big thing that's around here, if somebody steals your items, Mark mentioned it earlier, you guys are never at fault for somebody committing a crime. Say you left your vehicle unlocked, it, it is never your fault for doing it, but there are precautions that you can yeah, what's to up? prevent that from happening. So uh, we do have an idea here as well. I like flowcharts. It's what to do if, you're, um, if your vehicle does get car prowled, if your items get stolen. So we're yep. holding car prowls or somebody that you see is potentially going to commit a theft in the vehicle. Um, and all that is, when you go to the parks, if you have things that you don't want people to see or steal potentially, before you leave your residence to come to the park, place those things in your trunk so that way people aren't seeing you take the okay packages i'll be over there i'll, I'll, I'll be over there shortly in the trunk, now they know where they want to break in at um not leaving items in your car seat <laughs> making sure you don't leave your keys i don't in your know car. and um the, a lot of people are like oh well, i threw my jacket over it and so i didn't think people would notice it they're onto that game they know if there's a jacket just sprawled out very widely with a lump underneath it there's probably something okay in we'll do that so not leaving items in your car um that could potentially be um encourage right. for someone to break in and then obviously rolling up your windows yeah. and making sure right. that you lock your doors if you can't Please. keep your car invisible in view when it's in the lot that's even better keep an eye on it um but sometimes that's not possible you're walking around and doing that the same goes for when it's in your driveway though a lot of people say oh i'm at home i'm just gonna leave this out here for just a second always lock your doors every time try not to leave your items in your car if at all possible never leave your car running because you were just running out to grab something because it can happen in a second okay so the key thing is to remember to um just really put your items away before you get somewhere or carry them on your person when you leave the vehicle just to deter people from trying to go in and break it um, one of the next things, so a lot of people like to bike for a park. Have you guys ever heard of a bike index for Project 529? So, um, Sunday Parkway is coming up. If you haven't registered your bike, come to Sunday park Parkway and the Bike Shop Task Force with PPB. They will register your bikes for free. And I don't know if they're doing it this no, time, but they are do a U lock exchange as well. So, U locks are the best kind of locks for bikes. They even teach you how to put them on. You bring your old bike chain down, they'll swap them out for you. I'm not sure if they're doing it this time, but it's good to kind of um, check in with them and see. So PPB has a bike theft task force that all they focus on is stolen bikes. So you can actually do some specific reporting and contacting with them if you identify somebody who has been stealing bikes or your bike was stolen. You give a gift, a bike, as a gift to somebody, go on and register it for them. A lot of people don't like to forget to go on and register their bikes and do that kind of thing. If you give it to kids, they're probably not going to register their bike. Make sure you get on and register for them. That serial number is on the, uh, that center bar on the bike or sometimes it's on the up and down bar um, right there in the front. So there is the information here to be able to go and um, register your bike. You can even buy stickers that say like, basically this bike is registered and they're like impossible to tear off bikes. They're like super weather resistant and resilient. And that tells the bike thieves that your bike is registered. So if they do steal it, there's a higher chance that they're gonna get caught. So those things, uh, sometimes the bike task force gives those out for free at like the Sunday Parkway. But um, a lot of the time you do have to buy them because they work in correlation with those uh, national programs and trying to make sure that we can prevent bikes. Um, we're gonna, so the information that's in here for emergency preparedness, that's not really our, our specialty as far as um, all of this goes. We really do the crime prevention piece, but we do partner with emergency bureaus and whatnot. So um, we have the Portland Bureau of Emergency um, Management, which is PDEM, and there's like net teams. Do you guys have a net in your area? You guys know? Probably not. Probably a lack of response. <laughs> that's a neighborhood emergency team? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Okay. And they're volunteers, they get trained on how to do all stuff. So one thing that is important to know um, is you guys do have a beacon here at Ventura Park. Beacon is for the um, huh? for the earth for earthquakes. If there's a huge earthquake that happens, this is a meeting location. So you have emergency personnel that come here. They have like the good radios that work and communicate with emergency personnel. Um, they'll often bring like food, water, and small resources to help the residents that live around the area. Ventura Park is a beacon. So um, getting to know exactly where that um, location is, it even says on the cross street, so it's on the very last page, it tells you where it's at on Ventura Park. So it's on Southeast Stark Street and 117. And so that's, yep, that's gonna be right up there. And so that's where the beacon is. So if there's a large earthquake, a lot of people don't realize that if there's a huge 
like by like hazard as far as weather conditions go, the person that's going to save them is going to be their neighbor. It's less likely to be the emergency personnel. Um, and so it's good to get to know who's around here. And if you guys live around the park, getting to know who actually lives around the park so we walk together to do those types of things. Um, so the questionnaires that we collected from you guys, we're going to make you guys a block map. And a block map with, with parks. Parks are also not just people who live by the park, but frequenters of the park. Do you guys all live next to the park, or do some of you guys are just frequenters? Do you all live yeah, here pretty much? Or here, yeah, does anybody here not live around the close to the park? Right here? Yeah. So we live around the park, but her dad broke his foot, so he couldn't come, so she came hmm. for him. Uh -huh. Can he fax the sheet in? Um, so all you have to do when additional people want to join at any point in time, we're going to give your organizer more packets and information. Any new people who want to join